Okay, well, it is my pleasure to introduce Professor Rachel Fulton Brown. She's a professor of medieval history at the University of Chicago, but she has some very interesting side gigs. She also presents uh, video lectures at uh, unauthorized.tv on Tolkien. We got a sample of her uh, Tolkien lecture at last year's BasedCon. She has a channel, Logos and History, and she started a new venture which she'll be talking about. That venture grew out of a group she calls the Dragon Common Room on Telegram, and she's the, the headmistress of the Dragon Common Room. Uh, the Dragon Common Room, if I can unlock my webpage, to read more about it, uh, emerged in 2020 as a digital den of mischievous trolls, meme lords, culture vultures, gift pirates, history buffs, religious zealots, and Tolkien fans who found themselves assembled in a telegram chat room to defend the good, true, and beautiful in their dark corner of the internet. They've had a number of ventures, one of which is Centrism Games, which is one of the 99 cent book deals that you'll find on the, the book sale website. And Professor Brown will be telling us about her latest venture, Draco Alchemicus. Thank you. Okay, so thank you for having me back. Um, I'm very happy to be back for this second base con. And just so you know, Draco Alchemicus is your fault. <laughs> <laughs> I'll explain why. Last week, a weir of dragons gathered in Oxford to celebrate the works of J.R.R. Tolkien. I say celebrate, but some of the presenters were more concerned with what other people were doing with Tolkien, most notably you guys. Okay, maybe not you guys. You all write sci-fi, not fan No, but they're worried about, my guess is Professor Robin Reed, who was speaking at Oxenmoot in Oxford, right? So they get these Tolkien scholars are gathering in Oxford. And Professor Reed had a paper um, in which she purported that she was going to explore the alt-right's religious crusades appropriation of Tolkien. <laughs> I told you it was you guys, right? I only know about her talk because I was actually asked to comment by the College Fix, and there's a little article out there where I'm commenting on what I thought was going on there. So I can only guess what Professor Reed was talking about, but given that she has previously presented on queer atheists, agnostics, and animists, oh my, I think it's likely she's talking about Christians. No. <laughs> you can see it everywhere, the fear of Christians taking over Tolkien. This is the only way I can explain Amazon's rings of power. Have any of you watched it yet? Okay, good. <laughs> You're in the same place I am, because I haven't watched it either. I'm just going on the Dark Herald's uh, reviews on Arkhaven. Um, why else make Gladriel into the savior of her people, if not for fear of Aragorn as king? But you will say, I hope you will say, Tolkien's work was, quote, a fundamentally religious and Catholic work, whatever the woke might want us to believe. Is that so? What makes a story Christian? And that's actually what I'd like to talk about today. It's, it's interesting to me that in the Tolkien conversation, Professor Reed is specifically worried about this alt-right religious crusade, but I, th I do think she actually means in the sort of bigger picture thing, the cr Christian and whatever we're, we're talking about there. So what makes a story Christian? Well, Tolkien famously described the Gospels, the Gospels as a fairy story in which, quote, legend and history have met and fused. But even he forbore to put the Gospels in his own works, right? So why we end up in this conversation about whether or not Tolkien was Christian, he, he very purposefully, and he explains in that same letter where he says, yes, Father Murray, Lord of the Rings was a fundamentally religious and Catholic work, but I didn't put any religion in the story because I was worried about putting religion in the story. <laughs> and so you end up in this, this long conversation about what, what could Tolkien have meant um, writing a Christian or Catholic story and not in fact having the gospels or any recognizable Christian um, symbolism in it. So some, sometimes my students argue this, it's like, well, it's religious and Catholic, but only insofar as its author was Christian, that doesn't necessarily make 
the story Christian. So there, there's the two different problems, right? What does it say, mean to say a story is Christian um, as separate from saying that it's an author, a Christian author on the story? So I say there's, there's two different levels of question here. One, is there something inherently Christian about fantasy as invented by Tolkien? And two, what does it mean to write Christian fantasy? So is fantasy as such Christian? I'm going to argue yes, and then you all can get upset with me. <laughs> um, but what does it mean to write Christian fantasy if, in fact, we've claimed that the, the genre itself has a, has a Christian structure? Best way to answer this question, try writing some ourselves. <laughs> Draco Kim, why Draco Chemicus is your fault. Okay? <laughs> One, because I gave, the I, I gave the talk last year here on how Sauron made his rings, and from that emerged this story that we're working on in my dragon common room, Drake Alchemicus is, I'm sure you all have figured out, the alchemical dragon. That came out of the research that I did for the, Tol the Tolkien talk that I gave here last year on the making of the rings, the alchemy, the Elizabethan history of where alchemy is coming from. I talked about all of that last year, John Dee and his 007 and his angel conversations and so forth. And I concluded again last year with Francis Bacon and his New Atlantis. All of this, I realized, turned into the basis for this new project that we needed to answer. Well, what, 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 it, it started with what happened in the Elizabethan period. Um, now that we are uh, appropriately recognizing the death of Queen Elizabeth II, I'm, I'm finding the time, for, the time loops are closing in for sure because we started in this project with Queen Elizabeth I but we realized that we were bringing it actually into our time now. So this is a kind of medieval to modern story with the alchemical dragon at its center. Now we do have a website and Hans was, was reading some of our self description from the website. On our website, which I have, I of course have promotional material, so I'll give you these in a, afterwards. Um, that on our website we have a description of the forthcoming Drake Alchemicus project and we say uh, the Dragon Common Room, DCR, is currently working on a modern fantasy horror story written in the spirit of Edmund Spencer's The Fairy Queen and Francis Bacon's New Atlantis. The major premise behind this story, and I, I, I realize, you know, we're we're here at BaseCon because we got sick of being called names, but you're going to get even worse names being called by me here. <laughs> um, the major premise behind the story is that the Anglo-American Empire, and I say that purposefully because both the British Empire and the United States, was built on magic. Specifically, Elizabethan magic. Specifically, the kind of magic that I was talking about last year when I was showing you the power of the rings and the astrology and what Francis Bacon thought he was up to and showing you the new Atlantis. I rather think we've just heard the long-term version of that this morning <laughs> in our panels and saying our science technology is magic in this larger frame and we need to think about what kind of effect that has on us as human beings. Um, there's the culture and civilization element too, but I'm doing fantasy because I realize there's a spiritual element to the, the question. Queen Elizabeth I was responsible for the birth of empire in alchemy, but I've also learned in my reading over the last year or so, piracy as well. So we need to think about this as, I mean, the United States is very much a part of this. We are pirates. I, I've said this in my social media and in my blog and stuff. I'm directly related, like direct descendant of one of those pirates, <laughs> which ain't easy to get to say because he and his cousin started the slave trade. When we think about this Anglo-American empire that we are thinking about and the colonial project and the trade routes that were driving it and the reasons that they were able to expand in the way that they were, we're talking about well, you might say it is spice, and I was also thinking about this last summer when Dune was coming out, and I was looking at things like the Spice Road and the Maritime Empires and so forth. Spice is the drug trade. And I, I'm going to say it again, and you're going to have to ask me, the Anglo-American Empire is, is founded on spice, which therefore is founded on pharmacaea. 
you will remember now I've got your attention, I hope, or your horror. I told you this was a fantasy horror story, and the horror is going to come in these successive revelations of, oh my gosh, what have we been living in? The pharmacia we've all just lived through multiple at multiple levels. And I will say one of my co-authors in this project is in Australia. Hopefully she's watching now in the live stream because I've been live streaming with her. Our newest project is the Mosaic Arc on our UATV Telegram posted also on, on YouTube. She lived through lockdowns, nothing, it's something like nothing we saw in, in this country. And she knows what it is to be in that COVID locked world in a way that, I mean, I was here last year talking to some of you all about what was I going to do with my employer, the University of Chicago, with its vaccine mandates and its checking up on, you know, whether or not we put ourselves into the system. I'm worried about AI, not because of the AI. I'm worried about it because of the human beings <laughs> and what we do with our tools. I think of a, a AI, I will put it in this category, it's another spice. And I will help you think about what that spice means. This pharmacia, this spice, this allurement, it's all illusory. The power that the Draco Alchemicus has over us is all glamour. It's a face spell, spell, it's a fairy dream. But you think back to, I said, the two sources for this poem that we're working on are Edmund Spencer's The Fairy Queen and Francis Bacon's The New Atlantis. It's both fantasy and science, and we don't get outside of it. And I'm going to try to convince you of the truth of that in this discussion. The dragon, who we're talking about, and you want to see my slides are over there because we figured you could see them better in the shade. The Draco Alchemicus of our story, well, who is he? And there's, there's a, a lot of, you know, twinning layers of what's going on in the story. But the dragon, well, the dragon, the dragon that promises you spice and tech and control and drugs, you know who that is. It's Satan. I, I, I'm, I'm preempting myself from my panel tomorrow because I know who's in control if you let him. I know actually who's in control and it's our Lord God. But the degree to which we are tranced by, taken in by, glamorized by the spells, it's satanic and therefore very, very appealing. <laughs> How would you fight such a dragon? Assuming you wanted to. Herein lies the horror of the poem that we're working on. We don't want to fight the dragon. We want it to want us. We want, and I, I, I was just thinking, how am I going to script this for myself? We want, to, we want to serve it. We want to be part of its court. We want to find ourselves in its circle of power. Someone, way or the other, you realize Absolutely every single one of us serves that dragon. We lust after it. We crave it. The dragon is our addiction. Our precious. <laughs> I'm still talking about the ring, right? But it's, it, this, I said, I, I came to this story as of through the, the Lord of the Rings talk that I gave last time, thinking about Sauron's power was making something that they wanted. It can't come and get you. It's not, it's not the monster that comes and do serve willingly. It's our precious. It's our own. Which is why we hate the thought that someone might appropriate it. I've just made all of my colleagues demonic. <laughs> you realize. Or sinners, which I recognize too. I mean, I'm sitting there. I've been on a panel with Professor Reed, whose paper title I, I quoted at the beginning of this. She and I were both on a panel at Kalamazoo some years ago. We were talking about different ways we teach Tolkien, and I'm sitting there talking about creativity and art and you know, worship and prayer and things like that. I don't remember what she said. I know it was different from what I do. But you can recognize we in academia do this. I'm looking at you in the, the live stream now. We in academia do this all the time. You get very possessive of your own field, right? That's my field, that's what I work on. That, we want that dragon. We want it to be our precious, we want to serve it. And Professor Reed is giving this talk saying, oh, that alt-right, they might take over Tolkien and make it religious. And I was like, well, okay, we already was. But <laughs> you are in that, 
Uh, I think they've tried already, right? It's like, no, and the thing is, we, we, we want to say Tolkien is ours, Lewis is ours, they were Christian. Professor Reed and my other, you know, the colleagues in academia would say, no, we want Tolkien to be our thing. These people don't get to, appropriation, but that is a nonsensical claim. I, and this is what I said in the, the College Fix article. You can't, the only way you can appropriate problematically is if you're, you know, worrying about legal property. And we do have laws about that. Maybe they are problematic in their own way. But a culture is the way we take, I and mean, tradition is things adapted from the past. You can't appropriate culture and stories. You may infringe on copyright laws. But I am, you know, Professor Reed can say what she likes about the alt-right and the, the atheists in Tolkien. I can say what I like about Christianity and Tolkien. Those are both engagements with the story. It becomes, you know, d demonic when we start saying, you're not allowed to say anything else about it because I know it's right, right? A friend of mine sent me a screenshot yesterday morning with a comment, and excuse me, it's not clean language, <clears throat> F word, Amazon. What did Amazon said? And I think they must have put this up in a, I think I skipped a slide. There, this is what they said. Um, J.R. Tolkien created a world which by definition is multicultural. A world in which free peoples of di from different races and cultures join together in fellowship to defeat the forces of evil. Rings of power reflects that. trying not to say something. Our, our world has never been all white. Fantasy has never been all white. Middle Earth is not all white. BIPOC belong in Middle Earth and they are here to stay. Define evil. Would it include Saruman once he has assumed his cloak of many colors? They seem to have missed that, right? The rainbow cloak that Saruman dons is his cloak of control. Would it include Sauron? with his multicultural empire. I think that was one of the problems. Would it include going against the ban of the Valar to sail into the West and claim immortality? That is, in fact, the, the story problem that Amazon has fallen into because I, apparently, according to the Dark Herald, because I haven't watched it yet, Galadriel makes a choice to go to Valinor. She can't. She's a penitent. There's the whole point of the Lord of the Rings is that she cannot go west at the moment because she has still been tempted by the desire to be in control. And when she refuses it, when Frodo has it offered to her, then she can go to Valinor, but no, in the Rings of Power, we wouldn't have her go there before. So apparently, the ban of the Valor doesn't hold anymore, or I don't know. I, I do think there's sins against story, and that's, that's a different kind, right? Would it, would evil include human sacrifice to prevent aging and death? Which is, of course, what brought about the fall of Numenor, because Sauron convinces them to commit human sacrifice. The dragon is a magician playing bait and switch. And I do think in um, our thinking about this, that's where we get trapped quite easily. The, 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 the bait is here and, and you're being distracted from, it's like the, the BIPOC or the multicultural thing. That's a distraction from worrying about this other problem of in fact defining evil. And most of the people that I've seen online being upset about what the rings of power are doing is the rings of power as Fox and his booster um, patrol have done a really funny version of the ring of fire that's the rings of power. Okay, it's funny. It's very funny. But the, the, the real problem is not the multicultural problem. It's the refusal to recognize the, the story about, as being about the contest with evil and changing it in ways that undermine its theological claims. If the dragon is a magician playing bait and switch. How do we fight this dragon? Well, okay, so this is the project that we have in Drake Alchemicus, and I think I have the answer on fighting evil. Hey, there you go. <laughs> I have three, three things that I, or four things that I suggest, and I, I can talk at length about each one, or I can, you know, talk a little bit about it and then take questions, and we'll sort of try to mediate me for both, because you know I can talk a long time if I let me go. So, the three things that I have found as a way of fighting evil in our cultural context, one, iambic pentameter. You're gonna learn how to do that. Learn to scan. <laughs> Two, comic art. 
which is why I'm very happy that we have a new artist for this project. Um, for Aurora Berrialis, it was Hand Drawn Bear. This is a Portuguese comic artist, Zé Nuno Fraga, and I have some more of his pictures to show you and a story about how he found me, which is nice. Um, three myth in history, which is neither historical fiction nor allegory, but something else, which we're finding is actually quite challenging to achieve in, in this storytelling. And four, a choir that I'm actually doing this with the Dragon Common Room. It's not me alone writing it, but it's this, this choir that I'm trying to learn to direct. So it's very musical in that sense. Okay, so I'll, I'll work through each of these and then, then hopefully you have some questions. So iambic pentameter. Um, this one I could actually go on for a long time about because I taught a course on campus last year on writing Christian poetry. And we, I, I got the entire class to write a 50 stanza iambic pentameter poem by the end of eight weeks. So I know it can be done. <laughs> and working with them in a way to explain why we need poetry in our cultural voice, otherwise we lose that culture. And you think we've started with, let's see, I'll go back, go forward. There you go. Uh, the poem that we're writing, the Draco Chemicus, is actually in the, the, the mode of Edmund Spencer's Fairy Queen. It's also in the stanza form of Edmund Spencer's Fairy Queen. We had to learn to write Spencerian stanzas, which are iambic pentameter with his own line, line, elaborate um, rhyme scheme and so forth. Learning to write in this way has been, well, joyous, because I try to aim at most things that are joyous, but it's, it's like writing music in, in words. It's the, poetry is, in fact, the wedding of number and word. It's, it's the wedding of the quadrivium and the trivium. It is music expressed in breath. It is the heartbeat of our, our, own, our own bodies and of our culture and of our civilization. You think about what Shakespeare wrote, the great bits are in the iambic pentameter. You've got to have this um, verbal art, in fact, in order to express Christianity. And this, this I say, um, I'm drawing a lot on Malcolm Geet, who is a great living poet of, of the Christian tradition. He has a lovely discussion of the way in which poetry is, in fact, fundamentally incarnational because it's about both imagination and truth and you get that sort of the, there's a verbal element that you're working in your imagination and metaphor and symbolisms but because of its mathematical regularity in that iambic pentameter the da 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 it's literally your heart but it's also the numbers by which we live so if you're thinking about um, the sort of technological structures that you all like giving your stories that's the numerical. We, we, we need number for structure, we need it for architecture, we need it for music, and I think we actually also need it for truth. Poetry, therefore, works at a number of multiple levels. One, it's at the level of grammar, which is fundamentally about naming and pattern recognition. The, the, I, like I said, I could go on and on and on about this, but mostly what happens for the, the iambic pentameter is things we discover in the course of writing it. We have to make it rhyme, so the sound has to be right. We have to get the beats right, so it has to have the right measure. And knowledge comes to us by way of having to fill that form. It comes to us by way of having to get the numbers right, and the words come. It's, it's a very interesting process, and if you've not tried it before, I recommend it as at least an experiment. Poetry also changes the way we see. It reintegrates our reason with our imagination precisely because it's working with this number and word pairing. Right? It's the reason and imagination you are structuring the world as you are also trying to describe it. And it's, I, like I said, I, this is the third major poem that we've worked on together, this group, and I read a bit of Centrism Games last year. You all can see I read a bit of Aurora Berry Alice last night. Things have come to us in working on those stories that would, we would have never have discovered without having to do it in iambic pentameter. So. One, learn to scan. Second, the comic um, art. And the way that uh, Zeno, Zay, um, sorry, I put my slides out of order, but who cares. Uh, he found me because I had written um, some blog posts about a decade ago about how comics are, in fact, an incarnational art as well. And um, Zay is Catholic. 
He's in, in Portugal, and you should check out his website too, Catholic Comics, because he's got some absolutely amazing meditations that he's illustrating other people's texts, but he's creating understanding through his pictures in a way that the texts themselves can't carry. And he wrote to me and said, thank you so much for showing me that what I'm doing is fundamentally Christian. And I said, oh, I have this project I'd like you to share, join me in. Um, what I argued in those blog posts that he found is that and I was using Scott McCloud's Understanding Comics as my sort of spring off point here, but reading a number of other theoretical discussions too. Just as I'm saying iambic pentameter is number word, a hybrid of, of trivium and quadrivium, comics are in fact hybrid of text and image. And now what Zay is actually going to do for it is not a full graphic novel, alas, it's, it's going to be illustrations of our poems because he said it was going to be too hard to like illustrate graphically the whole thing but I think it still holds because he is as we're working on the poem showing us things in his art that we don't see yet in the words and vice versa and we learned that that happened too with working with hand-drawn bearer on Aurora Borealis that she would draw things for us that we had said in the words but then visually you see something else so that the the visual and the the verbal have to work together um, Comic art you know, has other interesting uh, characteristics that make it, I think, fundamentally incarnational to preoccupy with superheroes and superheroines <laughs> and battles against evil. So it's Christ, and they're all Christ-like in their efforts to save humanity, right? They're, one way or the other, they're saviors, whether through technology or birth or some combination of those. But um, one of the things, if you're familiar with McLeod's sort of wrestling with understanding comics. He's saying he kept wanting to do something other than superhero stories, and that's all he ended up writing. And I'm like, well, probably because the art form itself uh, is, is structured according to that kind of um, problem, which is, um, a, a, again, another layer, paradoxical like Christ um, himself. It's visible, like it's iconic. You have pictures that you can see the characters. Here we go. That's our Christ character in our story. Um, but also with, if you have full like speech balloons and stuff, you have a visual access to the interior of the character. So there's this twinning of visibility and divinity in the, in the, the comic form. Um, but they're also more than just icons because it's sequential art. It moves in time, right? So we have um, a, an interesting hybridity in both the poetry and the comic art. And that, I think, is where we end up with this wrestling with the problem of what does it mean to be incarnate souls. Um, so a, you will not be... A, surprised to realize that my third category is also one of these hybrids. What is myth in history? <laughs> How do we think about that as a problem? Well, this has, been, this has been a real wrestling match as we're writing because I told you all at the beginning, we're, we're, we're starting with Queen Elizabeth and the first and her alchemists and there's a story that goes through all of this of the pirates and the spice trade and the maritime empire. Um, our our main character manifests on a uh, manifest. He becomes incarnate through this pigeon cloud um, on shore, so that you have a city on the water that we're doing with all of these hybrids. But we are not writing historical fiction. This this cannot be something that is simply our characters in, inserted into either a you know a real past or a, a alternate past. It has to also work at this mythological level. But then on the opposite side, it can't be allegorical. It can't be simply, here we, here's our Christ figure, everything he does is going to be recognizably Christ, and once you unlock it, oh, boring, right? It, it, there, we don't want him to, okay, that, I finished with that page anyway. Um, we, don't, we don't want him simply to be Christ, although he is actually Christ. His name is Damien King, or Damien Stone, sorry. He's the king, but... This is because I'm so tech cool that I didn't print out all my text, and so I have the rest of it here. Um, so everything in this story, in the, the poem story, hinges on making the story work as a story while pointing symbolically to the reality of Christ. And how do you do that if you've given yourself a character that is named the cornerstone, he's Damien Stone, who encounters in his um, adventures 
well, first he, he, he first has to become incarnate, and then he's naked, and then we give him some clothes when he passes through the, door, the gate, right? So he passes into our story, into our reality. Um, but as he enters into the gate, he encounters this, this bouncer who's clearly an angel, <laughs> or maybe he's not yet, right? But it, it, that we're, we're trying to show the way in which um, Christ enters into our reality, takes on this, this physical self, right, that, that character, and then, um, this is as far as the pictures go right now, that he, he enters into this casino, which has a fountain court, which is sort of replete with symbolism and allegory and, and so forth, that you are now reali realizing you've entered into time, you've entered into the temptations, you've entered into the story, and then he encounters that woman. Now, if you are hyper attuned as I'm hoping my poets are becoming to the way I think, <laughs> uh, you will immediately recognize her as the Whore of Babylon, otherwise known as Eliza Drake, right? So we're playing, <laughs> she is, we're playing off of both. She has to be a real character. She has to have the symbolic force of what would it mean t for her to tempt Christ through the story without him falling into temptation, but with in fact showing all of the theological difficulties of our, as readers and devotees of that dragon, um, falling into sin. How do I achieve this? <laughs> what time? How much time do I have? Okay. So the, the, the other thing then is I'm actually not, I can't do this on my own. I absolutely cannot. I mean, I need the, I need the artist and I trust him more than putting the description into an AI right now because I tell him what to draw and then we have to figure out various things like, well, we're, we're doing a crowdfund. Um, and one of the, the things we're going to do for the crowdfund is uh, the, the, the top level is going to be a deck of cards. So we had to like just to describe all of the, the card faces for him. These are the kings. And you realize there, there's a sort of historical arc through there. Um, those are the Elizas. Again, I'll, you can look at them later. Again, there's a, his, the bouncer gets to be the jack. Um, the doves are the aces. And those are the jokers. And you get the, the sea and the land with the the, the um, dogs. He's got a dog, because of course you have to have a dog. Anyway, <laughs> I'm, I'm not doing this by myself. I couldn't do it by myself. And I have a group of people that have, been, have stuck with me through this project, um, through several poems now. And I asked them to tell you all what it's like working with me. So I have their, their input, right? Um, there are four of them that I'm writing with. And again, we have to do this as a group on a regular basis. It's very monastic. I'm Mother Superior, I guess. Um, <laughs> Ken says, and I told them they had to do 100 words, and he said, my words, well, 92. Um, writing poetry together is fun. The problem moves from writer's block to stop this writer's torrent. There's never a dull moment. Each dragon brings a fresh, fresh perspective to add. Healthy discipline forms. The meter structures ideas, feelings, and time. We hone a craft, good lives in that. Ralph Walder Emerson once said he saw a farmer at his plow as a prayer. He saw spiritual music in the care, the rhythm, the meeting of the elements. I like to think we're living in a similar sort of scene in the tea room. That's our writing group. It's a pursuit of the beautiful, the true, and the good. Um, Casey says, and this, this is also showing you, you're gonna get different voices here. We have to blend these, like in, and they're all in the, the work. This is Casey. Um, she says, how do you write a story that is seemingly devoid of goodness, but with goodness as its goal? How do you combine history, myth, and logos into a compelling fantasy? Now, how do you do all of that with a team of five writers of different education, experience, interests, and temperaments? Sound difficult? It is. <laughs> it's a struggle, but it is that struggle which challenges each of the writers on our team. I love that struggle, and I love this team writing process. Most authors wait until some critic picks apart their ideas. We do this instantly and easily with each other. We do. <laughs> um, because of our familiarity and budding friendships, and it makes the writing fun and the story better. Um, so Ken and Casey were both writers in Aurora Borealis, so they're with me too. Mel is a new, new one. Um, she um, is also responsible for helping me with a lot of video editing now, so we've got new talent in this. Um, Mel says, I'm a poet and I'd never know it if it weren't for DCR. Tracking down Rachel Fulton Brown through Telegram, as cliche as it sounds, has changed my life. I would get swallowed up in the propaganda drivel everyone else was drinking. Now I have a little shire amongst the expanse of the global villages of the electric age. 
to escape to hermetic paradise, hermet, I think she means hermits, uh, of our creative imagination. I never knew the adventures I would find in this online writer's room, but I am very grateful for this fellowship of writers our doctor has forged. One might call our common room the light that lives in the darkness, and we drakes can't help but flock to it like moths before a flame, the flame of love and wisdom of the incarnate word. Um, I'm very grateful that I have these writers working with me. I hope you can tell. Um, and Kilt, um, who's been with me from the very beginning with Centrism Games, and she and I are doing our new live stream, The Mosaic Arc, where we're talking through a lot of this practice that we're trying to explain. If you don't understand what I've just said now, there are videos. <laughs> um, this is Kiltz's description. How do all of our personal stories connect together to form the great tale of the human experience? DCR has been a journey to discover the crossroads of each of our personal histories in the great story. Under the wise guidance of Professor Brown, we are now learning what it means to do things like medieval subcreators. Writing together as medieval cathedral builders and not in the style of modernity's individualist architects, we have discovered the way that a work can absorb its creators into itself. Like myths, the DCR projects are made by us and make and remake us. It's been a trip to say the least. Um, so I could keep talking and tell you more about the story, but maybe it's better to do it from the perspective of you ask me some questions. Um, I do have, we have written the first 50 stanzas of the first act of, of um, the poem, and we're going to release it in five volumes, right? So that each volume will be about the length of Aurora Borealis. In comic form, we say, okay, so we're doing it in, in a series. Um, the fundamental lesson that I you know, hope to share or get across to you is um, don't let the dragon hypnotize you. Fight it with poetry, pictures, and riddles, and fellowship. And I'll take your questions. Thank you. Here's the, the, the cover reveal, right? That's the uh, the cover. Yeah. You said that Sauron seduces uh, Numenor practicing human sacrifice. Yes. I don't understand what the human sacrifice is. It's actual human sacrifice. So Sauron Sauron in the in the fall of Numenor, he's still incarnate. He's still able to take on a physical form and um, he tricks our Farazan into bringing him to Numenor, and while he's there, he it, it seduces the the people. They make they build pyramids. The the nobility or the you know the ones that get involved in this in this cult um, start sacrificing those who are still faithful to Iluvatar. So it's straight up human sacrifice. They 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 kill they and when Alindal and um, Isolder flee. It, uh, th that is, they're fleeing the cult that's killing people. It's human sacrifice, straight up. Yes, it's human sacrifice. And, and, and okay, so maybe I realize um, the demonic, and now that I have my pictures, okay, that one actually works. That's the back of the cards. So the, the problem in the, in the poem is we have this title, Draco Alchemicus, um, who is it? Now, if you if you look at the cover, I'll say, well, okay, here's here's a dragon, and that character is is. Hopefully, you see the Ece Homo um, painting in in the way we portrayed him there. So, he's Christ is, has to enter into the city, become incarnate, and fight the dragon. This is a straight up, you know, hero fight dragon. In this in this drawing, which one is the Draco Alchemicus? And then you start learning to think like a medieval <laughs> commentator on scripture. It's both of them, right? Because if you look at the, the, the cards, we have the alchemical dragon is the promise of medicine and science. It's the pharmakeia. Pharmakeia is the Greek for sorcery. So it's straight up sorcery. But the brazen serpent, the, the serpent that Moses lifted up in the desert to cure the people who are being bitten by snakes is also the crucified. So the Draco Alchemicus, the medicine in the story, is the, the antidote to the serpent itself. They're both the serpent. And to get to that level of understanding, I say that's what we are missing in our appreciation of what Christianity actually is. It's a great mythology. It's the, it's the most magnificent mythology you've never heard. Because it's, in modernity, been um, 
you know, one, it's been historicized so much that we think it's only about Jesus. So we think it's only about his earthly life and the historical Jesus. And two, we've lost most of this mythological thinking that is the fundamental structure of the tradition that I study in the Middle Ages. And it's when, so I guess this is answering my, my full question at, at the beginning. When people like Professor Reed are saying that the Lord of the Rings is not fundamentally Christian, they're completely missing the point. And she should know better because she's a medievalist. Um, that Tolkien was always working in this, this two-register two um, structure that history is actually fulfilling the prophecies and the, 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 you know, the story in the gospel is fulfilling the prophecy from the Old Testament. That the, this twinning of figure and revelation is essential to the Christian mystery. And that Tolkien was always very aware of that. So you, you can see his stories revealing themselves through the story as um, you know, theological truths. But you're not going to get it simply by way of an allegory or, or a... Um, you know, plug in, here's that character kind of thing. It's, it's at the level of parable and riddle, which is also what we're trying to do with Draco Alchemicus. We're trying to write it at the level of a parable or a riddle or a something. I mean, I, myth history is the closest I can get to it as a label, but it's the practice that I'm trying to show how you think as a medieval Christian, which is what Kiltz was referring to her in her comment, that we're trying to learn to think about the stories and the way in which the people who built the cathedrals did, so that we then see what that worship practice was like. Yeah. It, it seems that wokeism meets most definitions of a religion. Do you think Professor Reed will ever complain about the rings of power being an appropriate conflation of the Tolkien mythos with a religion? <laughs> wokeism is a religion. I mean, so I'd say, you know, we only have two choices. And this, I'm, I've, you, know, I, you gave me the stage for however long I still get, maybe 10 more minutes. I, I'm just going to, to say Christian, right? There's only two choices. It's serve Satan or serve Christ, flat out, right? And I, I say with the, the satanic, it's, it's, this seduct, it's very seductive, right? It's the desire for worldly power. It, if you think the temptations that Satan gives Jesus in, in, after his fasting, it's, it's comfort, it's social, like the angels will take care of you, it's worldly power. And... Um, if you see the if you see reality through this mythology, you get it. There's only two. It's like you choose Christ or you choose the world. And um, I think the I mean Amazon rings the power. I haven't. I indeed haven't watched it, and I'm not sure I'm going to. I don't. I don't really want to watch it. But on the other hand, I feel like I, I probably maybe need to to have authority. But oh gosh, really don't want to. What? I, well, that I've heard, right? You know, it's like, but be able to answer in detail I'm, rather than relying on other people's versions of it. I, I've watched the trailers, and I know I don't want to watch it. <laughs> um, that, okay, so the multicultural thing, I've written about that on my blog when my own university department wanted to make a statement about how we embrace diversity in, in our department, and I said, fine, I'll sign that. Because I know what kind of vision that actually is working within, it's Pentecost. It's not, I mean, the, this is why the sort of, oh, you know, Middle Earth is multicultural. Well, yeah, it's Christian. And one of the other things that Kiltz and I are trying to do in the Mosaic Arc is show that. Which she's, um, she lives in Australia, but she's a convert to Coptic Orthodoxy. She hangs out with Africans regularly in Australia because they're, they, they move there. But the, the, um, the ancient history of Christianity is... Um, the Apostle Philip meeting the eunuch of King, Queen Candace of Ethiopia, and the eunuch is already reading Isaiah 53 about the suffering servant, and Philip says, aha, that's been fulfilled, and the eunuch says, that's great, baptize me. That was in our last episode, the vending machine people. Um, that the, the complaints about multiculturalism are like, it's one of those bait and switches that I say. If, if you're actually within um, the, the Christ's vision of us as, you know, the children of God, we all are. And, and therefore, I, you know, Professor Reed can say what she likes about the Amazon rings of power. She probably, she and I would probably disagree about what's wrong with it. I guess. Yeah. And, and in, the, in the deep level of Tolkien scholarship, he wrote an essay on Sigawara land, which is the Anglo-Saxon term for Ethiopia. The, the burnt over, you know, the burnt regions. Um, he was born in South Africa, 
and had you know vivid memories of the house servants and the all of it that what I see us mainly as, as Christians is we're shattered into pieces. Yes, and, and th I mean, there's elements that are in Protestantism that the Catholics don't know. I, they don't read scripture as much in, in the Catholic, but then the Protestants don't use the pictures. And you see then we've, we've lost pieces. Yeah, and so with the, the storytelling, we're trying to, I mean, and the, the group that I have, you know, some of them are Catholic, Kilt is Coptic. Mel is is also either convert to Orthodoxy. So we're not working in any like singular denominational tradition. We're working in what I see as the the mythology. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, on the one hand, he sort of favored the, he didn't want Morgul to be capable of creation, that he could only twist, that was already there. Right. But he also went heavily towards the orcs and mindless animals because, because if they were, if they never had the knowledge of that, twist them, they die, they have to go to the falls of the map. Now, Christopher told me this about basically. Right. So what do I, the question is, what do I think about orcs? Yeah, and, and the orcs creation. Um, I think then you're in the, the, the realm of the difference, uh, the artistic insight and the effort to explain, which fits also with what I'm, we're trying to do in this. It's a, understanding comes to us through story. We, we seem to be I mean, deeply, deeply story creatures that, that somehow you know we, you all are here writing stories you want more stories because stories are a way of structuring understanding Tolkien like I mean as we're, we're learning when we're writing the story sometimes stuff comes to us and we're like we don't really know what it means you know you've all have experienced that you don't know what it means it goes in the story it seems to fit later you go and someone asks you where did that come from and you try to explain it a lot of what Tolkien did later in life is he had published the stories and then people kept writing him letters and saying well how about this um, I think sometimes he was dissembling right so I, I think this is my the opposite side of my what he's doing is the fundamentally Catholic he wrote that to a person he wanted to impress as Catholic it was Father Murray, and Murray was saying to him where, where did Galadriel come from and Tolkien said well you know I based her on the Virgin Mary he probably based her, in fact, also on Ryder Haggard's She, right? <laughs> Which Holly Ordway has shown in her book, and I was like, oh, gosh, darn it, right? So Tolkien, like we are in our poetry, was drawing on all the stuff, right? He's got the super stories out there. Things come to him. They fit in. Later, he thinks, why did I put that in there? I think that is the, 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 the author's explanation for why there's multiple explanations now then you realize we and this fits to rob's question it's like we as christians storytelling creatures w within a great story that we're participating in do theology i don't do theology <laughs> because you end up at trying to answer questions that end up with multiple answers and then you end up with you know 18 different church traditions and fights and <laughs> i'm glad you're laughing <laughs> right it's 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 a we are meant to reason about things but then we realize we're trying to answer things that belong in stories that only make sense in the stories. And I, that's, I'd, I'd, so I'd say that there's a problems with the ints as well, that Tolkien says they're the tree ints, and they're probably, in fact, drawing off of, again, Holly Ordway showed this in her book, they're probably coming out of Out of the Silent Planet directly. They're horns, they're the, the creature. Yeah, so, <laughs> and authors may, are not always fully conscious of where their stuff comes from. And then, and then you start realizing we're thinking about what it means to be inspired, what's revelation. How did you see those two things that fit together and they really make sense and you know it belongs in the story? Yeah. So my time is up. Okay, so we have a video to play um, to encourage you to continue to think more about Drake Alchemicus and um, Watch this space. <laughs>
it's gonna it's gonna play there with the music and the music we um uh moira grayland nelson now she just got married wrote for us you may know her in some context yes um this is in all, this is also to honor her for the work that she's done in telling the truth that's okay so um to find me there's a, a website the website with the you want to hand these out If, it, if you want a picture, there's a picture, there's a QR on the back for the, the website. In rainbow time, when dragons hoarded gold and pirates sailed the seas in search of spice, the city shimmered with electric cold, its storeroom stocked with In rainbow time, when dragons hoarded gold and pirates sailed the seas in search of spice, the city shimmered with electric cold, its storeroom stocked with precious merchandise, where dreams were bought and sold at dealer's price. A court convened, ruled by a sovereign snake, whose virtue was to capture slaves with vice. No spells could bind the alchemical drake, until one day a stranger came, its spells to break. He raids the city at the gate of night, a humble pigeon nestled at his breast, for he has come to play the game of light against the darkness of the dragon's breath and win his love back from the jaws of death. A fairy queen has seized the merchant's trove and calls herself by name Elizabeth. The pirate king comes forth with hound and dove. He goes to war to slay the snake and claim his love. Thank you. That was great.